I'm very, very pleased to introduce Robert Cheatham. He is the president and CEO of Azavia, a B corporation engaged in geospatial research and technology development for civic and social impact. Azavia's products include Cicero, a database of information on legislative districts and elected officials, and District Builder, which will be the subject of this lecture. Prior to founding Azavia, Robert served as a software developer and analyst for the Philadelphia Police Department, the University of Pennsylvania, and the City of Philadelphia. All right, thanks so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. I have um, not done a talk on District Builder in some time, uh, but in the last uh, eight months or so, I've had a ton of interest in, um, in the project, and uh, I'm really just incredibly pleased to have a chance to uh, share both some of the work that led to this and uh, our, our hopes and aspirations for the future. Uh, I was just at the NCSL, the National Council uh, for State Legislators uh, Conference, which is also being held in Boston this week. Uh, and all of the meetings on redistricting there were standing room only, uh, incredibly packed with both legislators and staff. There's a ton of interest in this. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about re uh, District Builder, but uh, many of you have probably never heard of Azavia, so I just want to introduce who we are a little bit. We're not necessarily a redistricting company. We are a, a, a small software business based in Philadelphia uh, that has about um, 65 people. And we primarily engage in building geospatial data analysis tools for the web, uh, uh, either building software or data analytics. We're also uh, what's known as a B Corporation. How many people here have heard of B Corporations? A few of you. All right, that's awesome. More than uh, used to be the case a few years ago. So B Corporations, the B stands for benefit. They're essentially for-profit businesses that uh, engage, uh, that operate with a mission uh, and use the power of business uh, as a force for good. Some of the B corporations you may have heard of uh, that are probably better well known than Azavia include Ben & Jerry's, Patagonia, uh, Etsy, Change.org, uh, Kickstarter, and others. So our particular mission is around applying geospatial technology for civic, uh, social, and environmental impact uh, some people call this a triple bottom line, uh, people, planet, and profits. Ours is particularly focused on, uh, as our mission states, uh, civic and social impact. We select projects that have uh, that uh, potential. We donate a share of our profits each year to nonprofit organizations. We run a fellowship program called Summer of Maps. Um, uh, we are also quite research driven. We enable our uh, colleagues to allocate up to 10% of their time for learning and research. We have a number of academic collaborations. We release a lot of our, our work under open source licenses and we're big users and supporters of open data. Uh, all of this translates into projects that, aim, uh, that are focused on land, water, and people. Um, we, in particular, uh, are interested in high quality, uh, visually impactful user experience design. Everything we do is related to geography and place. Um, uh, we both use open source uh, projects along with uh, commercial ones and release a lot of our work under open source licenses. Uh, District Builder is one of those, uh, what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, and as I mentioned, we're big supporters of open data, including running the lo local uh, open data portal in Philadelphia. A few examples of that uh, that I uh, will not go into detail about, uh, but I'm happy to uh, discuss uh, uh, afterwards. Uh, uh, machine learning work for uh, generating risk for, uh, geospatial risk forecasts, uh, visualization of climate change impacts and forecasts, or urban forestry work uh, around both managing data around urban forests, um, estimating ecosystem services value. Uh, working with satellite imagery, uh, we have a, a couple of research grants from NASA and the Department of Energy. Um, uh, as you all know, uh, unmanned uh, aerial vehicles and, and uh, uh, microsatellites are really increasing the number of number and amount of imagery that's available. Uh, and we're trying to turn this into a tool called Raster Foundry uh, that will enable people to work with this kind of data uh, online without a lot of uh, professional training. Uh, again, this is available under an open source license and we're particularly aimed at working with uh, humanitarian relief, international development and other uh, impact projects. We work with the World Bank. Uh, this is a project uh, around uh, transit planning uh, in China and Vietnam uh, that uses OpenStreetMap 
uh, transit data called GTFS uh, in order to visualize and plan transit networks and see the impact of that uh, on cities, impact of changes on cities. I mentioned our Summer of Maps program. Uh, one recent example, uh, we, this is a program where we match up nonprofit organizations that have geospatial data analysis projects uh, and with students who are studying spatial analysis. We're in about the sixth year of this. Um, uh, the example up on the screen is around um, the Ebola crisis and working with the Red Cross to understand uh, vulnerability analysis uh, across a section of Africa. All right, District Builder. Uh, District Builder itself was not something we set out uh, to build. The story behind this uh, goes back about 10 years. Um, uh, as was described in uh, the introduction, we uh, have been running a, a project called Cicero. Uh, Cicero is a database of uh, legislative district boundaries and the elected official information for who represents those legislative districts. And we run this uh, in about nine countries. We've got tens of thousands of elected officials, uh, thousands of boundaries. Um, and we uh, track all of that uh, around, um, uh, we track all of that not only for the current, but for, uh, it's necessary for us to track when uh, redistricting is going to be occurring get the boundary files and be able to uh, make them available for people who are trying to do advocacy work. So most of the people who use Cicero are nonprofit organizations who are trying to connect with connect their constituents with legislators, uh, local government, uh, and others. So we've been running this about 10 years, and early on when we were running it, uh, the first level at which we, we, do, we do this at local, state, and uh, uh, national levels in a number of countries today, but at the very beginning, it was largely a local uh, a council district effort. And we had about 100 cities across the US as well as uh, federal districts. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we, we enable our colleagues to spend about 10% of their time on, on research and learning projects. And one of my colleagues, um, a woman named Megan Heckert, uh, uh, looked at these districts and looked at Philadelphia's in particular. Now, Philadelphia's a 2000 uh, era uh, districts were some of the most, they looked like some of the most gerrymandered in the country. They were really um, uh, in bad shape. Uh, and she had the question, well, how bad is it? Uh, we live in Philadelphia. Uh, just how bad, uh, we're known as uh, uh, corrupt and contented. Uh, uh, just how bad are these districts? And, how, and can we come up with a metric for measuring that? So she did some uh, work and looked into a, a compactness metrics. This is a little bit of a cottage industry, I think, for uh, as you've probably heard from others, uh, from mathematicians and political scientists. But we took uh, four different metrics and we uh, made some modifications to them for different uh, purposes. But essentially came up with a, what we call the gerrymandering index, which isn't really a gerrymandering index. It's just a, it's an indicator of potential gerrymandering. Uh, and we came up with something that everyone loves, top 10 lists uh, for the worst districts in the country. Uh, for federal uh, and local ones. And it turned out Philadelphia had two in the top 10, uh, and I think the, num uh, the number one most gerrymandered district was amongst that list. So uh, this seemed pretty interesting. Uh, we wrote a couple of blogs about it, uh, and then put the material together into uh, a white paper that we released on our website. Uh, we didn't have a whole lot of aspirations for anything in particular, but. Uh, felt like this was an interesting project that was worth sharing. Uh, we were shocked to find that uh, lots of journalists thought this was very interesting too, and it ended up being used to write a number of articles and, and, and got mentioned. So we were uh, gratified that this had been uh, useful for people and uh, uh, thought, oh, that's pretty cool. So about three years later, uh, we were approaching the 2010 census, and, and we had not done uh, state districts, and we felt like we'd learned a lot and had a lot more data now uh, for uh, uh, doing this kind of evaluation. So we uh, decided to redo the whole project and both uh, build a website called Redistricting the Nation uh, in the run-up to the 2010 uh, census, um, and a... Uh, a series of tools that would enable people to enter their uh, district search that, where people could enter their own address, uh, find the district that represented them at each of the uh, federal, the two state levels, and a local level if it, if it was there. 
and then uh, compute these uh, compactness metrics for all of them and compare them so you could see how your district uh, compared uh, nationally. So that was pretty interesting. Uh, we got uh, lots of traffic and uh, also very good. But we had this idea, what if, if, if we can do this on the web, what if we could uh, create a web-based uh, software tool that would um, uh, enable people to do this kind of redistricting work themselves? Uh, so we did some sketches of what that might look like. But largely, I, we're, a, we're not a funded company. Uh, we're a bootstrap company. We don't have uh, independent funding. And so uh, this was something that was like, oh, that would be kind of cool. Um, but it didn't go much further than that. Uh, then we were contacted by a couple of folks uh, that some of you may know, uh, Michael McDonald, who's now at the University of Florida, and Michael Altman here in Boston, who's now at uh, MIT. Um, and they were interested in doing something uh, quite uh, similar to what we had thought about. More importantly, they had worked on a, an effort uh, going back several years, a uh, project they called Better Automated Redistricting, or uh, BARD. Uh, this was an R-based uh, software project that enabled people to have a, some seed districts and be able to generate plans automatically using a number of different methodologies and, and generate reports from them. Uh, but this was, this is an R package. It was not, it was aimed at people who could use R, were statisticians and mathematicians and software developers, not the general public. Uh, and they had a sense that there was a lot more demand for this, but for something that was very easy to use. In particular, they conceptualized an effort that they called the Public Mapping Project uh, that would create a software tool that would be web-based, would be open source, meaning the source code would be freely available to anyone who wanted it, and it would have a license to keep it that way, uh, that it would be designed for the general public, uh, that it would integrate uh, with a lot of the publicly available data, uh, and that it would generate, it was good enough to generate valid legal plans that would comply with the laws in, in most of the states in the US, and, and these laws do vary uh, quite a bit. Uh, would be nonpartisan. This was not aimed at the parties uh, doing the gerrymandering, but rather at the public uh, who might produce alternative plans, and that the overall project had an underlying uh, a principle of transparency and availability uh, for everyone. Uh, they were fortunate enough to uh, uh, talk to uh, program uh, officer at the Sloan Foundation, uh, Danny Goroff, who uh, provided them with a lot of the funding that um, for a number of different initiatives, one of which was the software uh, uh, that became uh, District Builder. I don't think it was originally called District Builder. I think it was, uh, if I remember correctly, it was the Public Mapping Project, but this was the product name that we came up with um, over the course of that initial version. So uh, with uh, the Sloan Foundation and, and other folks' support, um, uh, District Builder uh, uh, started being built. And I'm not going to go through the whole uh, development process. I just want to run through some of the features that the software uh, supports, uh, and then go through where it was used and some of the outcomes that came out of that. Uh, I'm not going to do a live demo, but I do have uh, a video that I'll also go through. And um, I understood that the internet was not going to be super reliable, so I, uh, I came with a video. Um, uh, but I'll, uh, I'll walk through each of these and then talk a little bit about where we'd like to go in the future. So in terms of features, uh, we were aiming not just for something that would be a simple drawing tool that, let's say, would show up on Google Maps, but would enable people to uh, create and edit and save uh, uh, through multiple sessions, uh, uh, multiple district plans. We wanted to enable people to uh, be able to use templates of those plans, either start with a blank map or start with an existing map and alter it uh, or be able to use um, uh, other kinds of templates. Uh, we wanted to be able to import and merge plans from other systems. So if someone developed something on, let's say, the, the Esri ArcGIS desktop and wanted to import that as a starting point or, or submit it, or be able to use another system uh, uh, or, or generate one here and be able to merge it with another person so you could work together as a group, we wanted to be able to support that. Uh, we wanted to display uh, demographics and be able to support election uh, results data as well as others. Uh, we wanted to be able to integrate with uh, a number of the existing base mapping systems, Google Maps, uh, Esri, Esri's ArcGIS Online, uh, OpenStreetMap, or, or Bing Maps. 
Uh, that's kind of cute, uh, Bing Maps. <laughs> I suppose we all remember that, but that's several years ago now, and it gives you a sense of uh, how long ago this was. Um, we wanted to show additional reference map layers. Uh, we uh, learned over time that users didn't just want to be able to see the, di the, the components that went into the actual redistricting plan, but they wanted to be able to refer to other things like school district boundaries or, uh, uh, or uh, neighborhood boundaries or community areas. Uh, we wanted a system that could automatically calculate on the fly whether or not the districts were contiguous, uh, different compactness metrics, and population uh, balance statistics as you're creating the plan. Uh, we learned that many users didn't want to use just the, the, the legal requirements for a particular uh, plan, but wanted to be able to uh, um, use uh, other demographics, other kinds of geographic data, and compute those statistics on the fly. Um, uh, we wanted to be able to enable people to get most of the way on a plan and then find the unassigned areas. When you have very large statewide plans and you're using, let's say, blocks to compose, census blocks to compose those plans, you're working often with, in a large state with hundreds of thousands of those blocks and it's easy to miss them. So this ability to sort of nibble away at the, at the, the, the locus, uh, the, the nearest blocks in order to make sure they're all uh, assigned. So find the unassigned ones and then assign them. Um, be able to draw out communities of interest and evaluate uh, plans against them. Uh, so uh, be able to say, here's a community of interest I care about that may not be an official area, uh, and I want to know whether that's split or to what extent it's incorporated uh, into the plan. Uh, evaluate uh, proposed uh, plans against uh, legal requirements. Be able to know whether or not this plan will comply with uh, legal requirements in the particular jurisdiction. Uh, save these, share them with others, uh, and then um, some more advanced features around supporting not just uh, public redistricting processes, but being able to run competitions. Run competitions means you need to be able to score uh, plans on a number of different metrics, uh, and then it potentially show leaderboards uh, that show top, top 10 lists and, and so on under those different metrics. Uh, and then uh, very late in the uh, project, uh, th we uh, added some ability to support multiple languages. So you could have a Spanish language user interface as well as an English language one. Um, and we tested several languages for that. Uh, and then finally, um, be able to support uh, uh, multiple nested jurisdictions within the same implementation. What I mean by that is, in many uh, states, there may be a simultaneous process that's happening at the state level as well as at local uh, municipal levels and the opportunity to have a single implementation that supports both of those uh, sets of things with a common underlying uh, data set to support them. So we ended up uh, using this in, uh, in Minnesota and I'll talk a little bit about one of those examples. Uh, so I, I heard that this is uh, kind of a, a mixed group of folks, a mix of attorneys, political scientists, economists, software developers, designers, and a variety of others. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to go a little bit into the technology thing, but I'm, I'm not going to try to dig into this uh, too deeply. I'm happy to take questions about uh, technology stuff if you're interested uh, later. Uh, in terms of the types of technology we're using under the hood, all of these are open source tools. Uh, we did uh, support things like Google Maps, which is not open source, uh, but is, freely, is, is free for use as long as uh, it's for a, a, a public interest and is publicly available. Uh, uh, we used a software toolkit uh, that's uh, based on the Python uh, language called Django. Um, this is a web-based uh, application development framework. A database uh, called Postgres and a geospatial extension for it called PostGIS. Uh, we used GeoServer for generating map tiles, um, a jQuery for the user interface, a mapping, interactive mapping tool called Open Layers, uh, and then a Python uh, a toolkit for doing asynchronous uh, tasks that which were often necessary for ingesting uh, data uh, called Celery. Uh, we aim to support two different kinds of platforms, both uh, public uh, cloud infrastructure, uh, we particularly targeted Amazon Web Services, or uh, being able to run it on your own servers, um, uh, such that you could run this in your own data center or, or uh, uh, use other types of infrastructure. Um, 
So after a lot of slides with bullets on them, uh, let me actually get to the, the software application. This is a screenshot of the user interface. Um, let's see if this works. Uh, there's a, a toolbar across the top. Uh, the, the application is organized into some, some basic steps to plan, uh, actually draw the maps, uh, and then uh, share or submit those maps. Uh, the map itself is in, the, is in the center with a legend here. And then on the right-hand uh, side are a series of uh, uh, metrics that are computed on the fly that show uh, how close you are to the population balance uh, for a given district, whether or not it's contiguous, that's what that green check mark is, um, and then the uh, compactness metric, depending on, it depend, the, the actual number depends on the metric that you've configured it for, but uh, uh, gives you a sense of what's possible. Uh, this has all been released and continues to be available uh, on uh, GitHub, uh, which is an open source um, uh, software um, uh, versioning system, public versioning system. So if you go to districtbuilder.org, uh, you can see the source code there. Uh, and the real question is, um, I mean, the goal of this was to be able to support public transparent redistricting processes. And there were a number of areas that uh, we were involved with, and we also know that because it's open source, we don't know everywhere where it was used. Um, uh, but these are the ones that we're aware of. It was used uh, at both the state and local level. Uh, Contra Costa County in California used it to support their uh, public uh, outreach efforts that their local regulations required. It was used in Arizona uh, by a nonprofit organization called Competitive uh, Districts Coalition. Uh, we used it in Philadelphia for a citizen and uh, news media uh, competition uh, called Fix Philly Districts. Um, the uh, Joyce Foundation supported implementations in Ohio, uh, Minneapolis, Indiana, I think, uh, I'm pretty sure Michigan and uh, Wisconsin were also in there. Uh, we know that it was used in Vermont, uh, in um, uh, Burlington, and uh, in another, a couple of other efforts, uh, Redistrict New York and one in Virginia uh, for college student uh, redistricting competition. So I'm gonna uh, highlight a few of these and some of the outcomes. Um, uh, some of these we were directly involved with, some of them uh, uh, we were only either configuring and setting up the infrastructure, but uh, there are other folks. I think uh, Michael McDonald is going to be here on Thursday and Friday this week, uh, and if you have specific interest in some of the uh, things like the Virginia competition or some of the others, he may be able to answer um, those types of questions. But in Virginia, uh, this was a, an effort uh, funded by the uh, Judy Ford Wasson Center for Public Policy at Christopher Newport University. Uh, it was aimed at college student, uh, teams of college students at several colleges across Virginia um, and uh, was aimed at both, uh, I think, congressional and uh, uh, state uh, assembly and senate. Um, they had some uh, very interesting outcomes. I think the fact that college students were doing this uh, made it uh, tough for the legislature to, to say this is too hard uh, to do well. Uh, uh, but uh, in fact, uh, one of those teams at uh, William & Mary ended up uh, drawing uh, three minority opportunity districts, um, and uh, because all of this was done transparently and in the open, uh, this particular plan ended up becoming the basis for a legal challenge in Virginia. So while we had no expectation that the state would adopt any of these student plans, the uh, legislature uh, was not going to do that. Um, the fact that, that uh, these were available, transparent, and in the open uh, enabled them to have an impact uh, nonetheless. In the Minneapolis case, this was an implementation that was both for the state level and the local level, but at the local level, uh, it was, turned out to be particularly useful. Minneapolis had passed a commission uh, uh, ordinance uh, that was created, uh, sorry, not an ordinance, as part of a ballot initiative in 2010. This commission was going to have 11 members on it. Um, they had bought uh, one license of the standard desktop tool for doing, commercial desktop tool for doing this, Maptitude. Uh, it was pretty tough for the 11 of them to work together, so they ended up using District Builder to uh, work as a commission. It was simpler to use, the data was all in there. Uh, but they also wanted to have some public engagement, and they ended up making this available to the general public. Uh, two community groups um, in Minneapolis, a Latino group and a Somali group, ended up drawing districts uh, that specifically um, uh, serve their uh, local communities. Uh, the commissioners found these districts compelling and ended up adopting them um, into the map. 
Uh, and then in the 2012 election, the first Latino and the first Somali representatives uh, ended up being elected. Uh, the outcome, I think, uh, we would all agree was probably better representation for Minneapolis. Uh, the last of these uh, that I'll highlight is for Philadelphia. Um, this was uh, not an, uh, an official uh, project, uh, meaning the, the city government did not seek this out. Uh, rather, city council had in previous years promised after uh, having been shamed for how horrible the districts were, uh, had promised public hearings. And then as summer approached, they said, ah, never mind, we're not gonna do that. <laughs> so uh, a number of journalists uh, got um, uh, pretty exercised about this, um, and they uh, approached us uh, about r potentially running a, a competition. Um, a competition that, we, we had, none of us had any money, so this was gonna be uh, very small stuff. Uh, we had some support from the local NPR affiliate, WHYY, to pay for some small prizes that consisted of, I think, uh, Kindles and I think maybe $500 or something. Uh, so very small um, uh, 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 prizes at stake. Uh, but we designed a competition in which there would be three different categories or scores um, for uh, assessing districts. Uh, we would assess them based on compactness, based on uh, population balance, and ward splits. In Philadelphia, uh, we have a... a a system of political wards uh, that are a, a unit of political representation. Wards have elected ward leaders, and the city charter requires that um, uh, city council district plans minimize the number of uh, ward splits. Wards are then subdivided into voting precincts, or ward divisions, as they're called, uh, and districts are made up of those ward divisions. So a little bit different setup from a standard uh, census block um, uh, but it is, it's the way the system works in Philadelphia. So we wanted to have a score that said how many splits and how bad are they. Uh, uh, we felt like uh, there was a, uh, potentially a need to talk through what, why we were doing this and, and, and what, the, um, what the interest was. So WHYY uh, uh, ended up organizing a public forum and we had some support from the Penn, University of Pennsylvania uh, civic engagement team. Uh, and we really had very little time. We had about two weeks to get this going. We knew that council was going to start hearings uh, in, uh, their council was going to reassemble. They were not planning on any hearings for this, uh, uh, but they were going to be probably be making decisions in September. I believe they had to have them done by November. So we had about two weeks to get this up and running, and we wanted to run the competition for at least four weeks in the worst possible time, uh, the middle of August. Um, so we had, uh, though you're all here, so maybe that's the best possible time, I don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, we wanted to run a public forum, we wanted to run some uh, training webinars. This public forum ended up standing room only in the middle of August, right after a hurricane, and I think we even had an earthquake that week. Uh, it, was, uh, it was astounding. Uh, city council members showed up to uh, give their support. Uh, there was so much press about this that city council ended up saying, you know, we said we weren't gonna have hearings, now we're gonna have hearings. <laughs> uh, we're gonna do two of them, they're gonna be neighborhood hearings. Uh, we're gonna hold them in the neighborhoods that have had the most concerns about this in the past. They'll be public, and we're gonna invite the winners of this competition to come present their plans. Uh, so this was a huge turnaround, and just that alone, the amount, much greater transparency in the process, uh, we felt like was a win. So uh, fixed Valley districts uh, looked like this, had a sign up uh, uh, form, and we had, uh, uh, substantial um, uh, uh, positive outcomes from this. Not only did we have standing room only forums and lots of people uh, uh, signing up and, and starting to work on plans, um, the winners that came out of this were just astonishingly good. Uh, this is the overall winner that combined all three of those metrics uh, and ended up winning the top prize and then we awarded uh, smaller prizes and runners up in each of the three categories I mentioned earlier. Uh, you can see on the left-hand side what the plan this person came up with, and on the right-hand side, that overlaid against the, the current in-place plan, which, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, has some of the most gerrymandered uh, districts in the country. Uh, so a, a astounding improvement. Uh, the outcomes were also fairly positive. Uh, similar to lots of other places, we had no expectation that city council was simply going to adopt one of these public plans. 
but we had 31 submissions for prizes and over 1,000 plans uh, got started and people set up accounts and started creating plans. City Council held these public hearings. Uh, they invited the winners to present plans at the second hearing. Uh, and we got, I wouldn't say a great district map, but one that was perhaps less embarrassing. And I think that's uh, quite substantial progress. So this is what that, what that looks like. Uh, this is still up and running. It's the one instance of District Builder that's still going. Uh, you can find it at fixphillydistricts.com. All right. So for the next thing, I'm actually going to try to show a video. Uh, let's see how this goes. So I have um, the video itself is about an hour. You can find it if you go to fixphillydistricts.com under the resources page, and it will. You can play the whole thing there. It's essentially a tutorial that walks you through. Uh, using District Builder. Uh, we do not want to watch this for an hour, I'm confident. So I am going to, um, I've written down some timings, and I'm going to attempt the feat, uh, there should be an Olympic sport for this, uh, of actually jumping to the right videos. Uh, all right. Uh, where's the mouse? It does not have audio. Uh, it does have audio. I've just muted it. Uh, let me double check that I have muted it. Um, so uh, what we are, we've logged into District Builder. We've created an account. Um, and uh, what we're seeing here is, uh, it may be a little blurry, but I'll, I'll try and walk through it. Um, a number of different ways to start a plan. So you can have a, 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 temp, a set of templates. In this case, we wanted to start with current city council districts, as well as just a blank map. There's the ability to show shared plans. So these are plans that other people have shared that you could potentially use as a starting point. We found this was important uh, to enable groups of people to work together, as well as to learn from each other. Uh, so you're not always starting from scratch. Uh, you can save multiple plans yourself. So we're looking at a My Plans screen, and those can either be shared or not. Uh, and then the ability to upload a plan. So uh, over on the right-hand side, uh, you can, there it is, uh, you can see the ability to set up, uh, uh, name the plan, describe it, uh, and then be able to um, uh, apply some, uh, some settings for the starting plan. All right. Okay. Next. Uh, I did not get my little timer coming up. There we go. So the next, I'm going to do a little bit of a, a, a review of the overall application itself. Uh, so we've actually got into a plan here. In Philadelphia, um, we set up their, the scale thresholds. Um, what we learned was that when people are looking at the whole picture, they rarely want to see all of the details. So we have scale thresholds that display different levels of geography at different uh, uh, points. So when you're zoomed all the way out, you see wards. We'll see a little bit later, as you zoom in and need more detail, that subdivides into the, into the voting precincts, which, as I said earlier, is, is the unit that Philadelphia uses. Uh, across the top, you've got a couple of different tabs, one aimed at s selecting districts and assigning them, and then some more advanced tools in the second one. Uh, I'll walk through a couple of these and, and what, they, uh, what they actually look like uh, in a sec. So I successfully got to the right place, but didn't actually hit play. Uh, so uh, we're walking through a few of these, but you can also see that over on the right-hand side, we've started with a blank plan, meaning there are no districts on this yet. Uh, we are perfectly contiguous um, and have no population balance. Um, but we're also seeing some additional uh, statistics that are showing up, up, up on top that can be configured for each, uh, uh, each particular instance. All right. There, did we get to 16? We did, okay. Uh, so uh, we're looking at uh, now how the process of selecting works. So we've got a, there's a, a number of different selection tools. You can select a single district. Uh, you can select a rectangle around uh, a particular area, as well as draw a polygon to, uh, 
create a much more fine-grained uh, selection. Um, and this is how that selection process works. Uh, uh, the person was, was just doing individual ones, and if you control click, you can select multiple ones, uh, similar to a lot of other graphic software. Uh, and then you can, as she's showing here, draw rectangles um, uh, to select multiple districts. All right. Arg. Sorry. Maybe I should just move along. Uh, so 17, all right. So here we're actually taking some of those selections and we're assigning them to a district. This is a process that you'd use if you were starting with a blank map. So select a set of geographic units, assign them to a particular district. Uh, so that's the first one. Uh, We've done that assignment. As they get assigned, those districts show up and tell, start to tell us what the population balance looks like and whether or not they're contiguous. Uh, here's a second district assigned uh, in the same manner, and you can see that these, this moves pretty quickly as you're, um, uh, once you get the hang of it. Uh, there is also an ability to pull up overlay maps. Uh, sometimes it, it, this varied a lot, but in many places these might be uh, race or ethnic groups, they may be past election results. Uh, the system's pretty configurable, so it covers a broad range of, of, uh, of different things. All right, I'll move along here. Uh, the next uh, thing we're gonna do is start to uh, zoom in a little bit, and as you can see, as we zoom in, we're now seeing the more subdivided uh, ward divisions. Uh, over on the right-hand side, you can see as they're generated, uh, we're getting these statistics uh, uh, redone on the fly, but there's also a drop-down here so you can add uh, other kinds of statistics. So a particular system can be configured with uh, dozens, if not hundreds, of different uh, metrics or statistics that you can use as, as reference material and be able to generate maps based on that. All right. Uh, some of the other uh, neat things that I think are unusual in web-based uh, tools were the ability to not just be able to select and assign, but be able to uh, drag and um, uh, be able to drag sets of things, hit drag and drop, and simply drop them onto the district that you want to assign them to. I don't know if I can find a particular spot here. So here's a, a, a plan that's complete, it covers the whole city, but isn't balanced yet. You can see that the, the, green, the different shades of green are reflected in the different shades of green in the population balance uh, indicator. And as these come into closer balance, I, the, the, plus, the green and the yellow is for plus or minus, and as they come into closer balance, the, the map evens out uh, in terms of color. All right, uh, that's for doing statistics. Uh, and I'll move forward. There's a, also a sharing mechanism. Uh, so you can take your particular plan, share it with others. You do that by assigning a name to it uh, so that other people can recognize it. Um, in addition, in this particular case, because there was a competition, there were instructions for how to uh, go about submitting that. So not only, if you shared something, not only was it available to other people who were looking for shared plans, you would get a unique URL uh, that you could then use to share via social media and others could um, uh, access that uh, just by having that URL. All right, I will stop the demo there. Uh, well, here's a look at what the leaderboards look like. Um, uh, these were top 10 lists for equal population and compactness. Uh, and I won't go through some of the more advanced features. Um, uh, this ability to generate split reports, uh, to do copy and paste between different uh, districts, uh, downloading and uploading plans uh, using uh, comma delimited text files and so on. So uh, that is uh, a brief demo um, of District Builder. 
Uh, in closing, I want to highlight a couple of other, um, oh shoot, um, a couple of other things that are worth uh, uh, pointing out. Um, the first of these is, is uh, the range of challenges that we ran into in, uh, in building this. Um, these uh, varied uh, quite a bit, but uh, uh, were consistent things that came up uh, in each of the Im implementations that we did. One was around scalability. Uh, if we're going to run these kinds of competitions and we're going to have all of these on-the-fly metrics being computed, it actually used a fair amount of computing power to do this. And if you're running a competition and it's being mentioned in the news media, you run the risk of having a lot of people all trying to access the system at the same time. Uh, and this created a scalability problem in some, uh, in some areas. Uh, if you had five people or 10 people using it, it tended not to run into too much trouble. But if you had 100 people all hit it at once, um, we ran, really ran into problems. Uh, we found it necessary in, in cases where these systems were particularly popular, where they were showing up in the news media, we saw really spiky uh, usage. And so we developed a mechanism to, to throttle how many people, limit how many people could uh, access this and do editing at the same time. So we could have fairly large number of people viewing things, uh, but the computational challenge was around supporting editing and, and um, uh, score calculation. Uh, it didn't need to be done on every implementation, but particularly where there were competitions and there was a lot of news media coverage, uh, this became necessary. We'd like to really change that, but um, it's what the solution we came up with, uh, with the funding we had at the time. Uh, the second was around user experience design. Uh, we really aimed for simple user interface, uh, simple interaction, but this took a lot of time to get there. What you see now uh, is uh, fairly simple and involves a, a, a lot of user feedback, but that means building software in a very iterative way. And the first version of District Builder did not, uh, uh, was not that easy to use and took a fair amount of feedback and watching people, standing in the back of a room, watching people try to use it to, to see where, um, where they got stuck and then making improvements accordingly. Uh, there are collaboration costs. Uh, this uh, was often uh, not just us building software based on, on watching users, but there were often uh, third parties who were involved in each of the implementations, as well as uh, Michael and Micah uh, along the way as the principal investigators and, and, and what they saw as the priorities. Um, these things, in, these types of collaborations, while it's easier to go run uh, uh, on your own, uh, there's a lot of value to collaboration, um, but they do, does impose costs both in terms of uh, time and, and uh, effort. The time frame itself was tight. We didn't get started on this until 2010, uh, probably only about six months before the data was going to be released. So it was a, the first version was very much a crash uh, uh, application, uh, a crash effort to, to get it done in time. And then uh, we would, weren't really happy with what we had come up with uh, for another year or so after uh, uh, when some of the jurisdictions had already done their redistricting. Uh, these time frames vary a lot from state to state and city to city. And then the last one is sustainability, that uh, uh, the project's now been on hiatus for three years. Uh, we haven't had any funding to keep it up. We've accumulated a lot of what's called technical debt, essentially new versions of all the underlying tools that have uh, uh, come in place, new browsers, new operating systems, and a variety of other things. Uh, this isn't actually easy to get up and running anymore. Um, and that ability to sustain things over time uh, requires ongoing resources, and it just didn't have it. All right, so uh, what's next? Um, uh, well, we're in the midst of planning what we are calling District Builder 2.0. Uh, there are not only the challenges that I outlined, but a number of what I see as significant problems that complicated and reduced the number of people that could actually use this. One is it was expensive to get this up and running and keep it going. The reasons for that were the, how complicated it was to set up. Uh, it was relatively easy to use once it was there, but the underlying software tools and the, the uh, uh, complexity of the system made it difficult and there required a, a number of specialized skills to do it. It took a, a, a couple of weeks usually to get a new instance running. The data loading process was complex and, uh, and fraught. Uh, and you had to run your own infrastructure or you had to pay for uh, infrastructure and that cost. And because we had the whole system, uh, each instance had its own entire infrastructure, uh, there was some um, uh, 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 lost resources because it wasn't uh, shared across uh, multiple uh, users. And then I already mentioned sustainability. 
So we have a number of improvements we think we'd like to make in the time since we originally built this. The census has now released data APIs, application programming interfaces that, uh, that people can, uh, the general public can use, but more importantly, we can create machine readable data uh, ingestion systems that would leverage these APIs that I think would lower the cost of getting data into it. Uh, we know a lot more about architect. This was early days for Amazon Web Services when we first built this. Uh, Amazon Web Services itself, as well as other cloud infrastructures, come a long way. Uh, we know a lot more about how to architect for, for shared infrastructure. Uh, in particular, be able to run potentially a national scale infrastructure where instead of installing the software for each instance and configuring it custom for that particular instance, we could potentially uh, have a, the installation all done and just be configuring uh, for each one. We'd like to run it at national scale or support the ability to do so uh, at the state and uh, local level. We'd love to go back and integrate what we've learned about user experience design in the years since then uh, to improve on that. And from a sustainability perspective, we think there's a lot of demand for not just the legislative districts every decennial census, but uh, district planning on an ongoing basis, whether that's voting precincts, trash truck routes, police districts, school districts, and even in commercial uh, um, uh, environments, uh, planning things like sales, uh, sales districts. We think that if that was possible, and this was a little more generic or enabled these other kinds of districts to be planned, that we could keep this running on an ongoing basis um, uh, for a relatively modest cost. Our big picture goal is to get this from about 80 hours to get this up and running uh, to about 80 minutes. Uh, uh, that's still not instant, but uh, we, think that, um, we think that that's doable. Uh, but in general, uh, we'd like to have a lot more people like this. Uh, have you all heard about Amanda Hall over the course of the last couple of days? How many people? No one. All right. Uh, Amanda Hall is uh, uh, one of my heroes. Um, uh, she ended up, she's a piano teacher uh, and a graphic designer. She lives in Pennsylvania. Uh, she saw the plan that came out of the state legislature, um, and uh, she felt like she could do a better job herself. Uh, she ended up not using District Builder. Uh, it wasn't around, I think, at the time and would have been complex for her to set up. Uh, but she used some, some fairly straightforward tools. She tracked down her own data from the Census Bureau and she drew her own maps uh, and then wrote a blog about it. Uh, and these turned into uh, part of an amicus court brief uh, for a, a challenge that ended up going to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Uh, that kind of thing, that kind of uh, ability to access the data make your own plans, publish them, and then do that in a transparent way. While it does not replace an independent redistricting commission or some of the other solutions that people have suggested, uh, it can have a, a, a big impact in terms of balancing the scales uh, in favor of the public. And that wraps things up. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, does Azavia aspire to have District Builder become the standard mapping tool used by redistricting commissions across the US? Are there other competing product, products with this ambition? Uh, do we aspire to have this, uh, the standard tool? I, I mean, the software, software world's a very competitive, innovative place. Uh, we would like to have District Builder be the go-to tool for people who are aiming to have public processes that are focused on transparency, public access, uh, and so on. Now, independent commissions may be able to perform that kind of work more effectively, provided they're not trying to do it with the public, um, using some of the standard commercial tools. And I mentioned some of them. Uh, Maptitude, which is made by Caliper Corporation, is probably the go-to desktop tool. It comes prepackaged with census data. It is very good. It is the standard gerrymandering tool. Um, and, I, and I don't, I, I, obviously that's a, a, that's a negative thing, but it's the standard gerrymandering tools. It's very good at what it does. And uh, in the last census cycle, Caliper did release a public web-based uh, tool. Um, the, information, the feedback we had was that it was uh, uh, fairly difficult to use and didn't have broad uh, usage in the same way that their desktop tool did. There are others for desktop uh, work. Uh, uh, Autobound is another one made by um, uh, a company in uh, Virginia 
uh, that, and it's a plugin for the Esri ArcGIS desktop platform. I've also heard good things about that. I haven't, um, haven't used it myself. Uh, and Esri, Esri as a company uh, created extensions to their desktop uh, software for doing redistricting in the previous census cycle. They also created a web-based application that was used in Utah and a couple of other public redistricting efforts um, uh, to great success. Uh, Utah did not have an uh, independent commission. The legislature did it. Um, but uh, they involved the public in the process, and a public plan ended up being the one that was adopted for school districts, almost intact. Um, they didn't run a competition, but they did run a very public process with 17 public hearings, uh, hundreds of submissions, uh, uh, many of them uh, legal and compliant, and many of those submitters ended up presenting at these public hearings. I think that's a step forward, and I think Esri did some really interesting work there. Uh, I, I, what I think is as a differentiator here is that we're aiming for ease of use, public access, transparency, and supporting uh, a public advocacy efforts as well as um, uh, people who might want to run this on their own without buying commercial software. Do you see realistic potential for a nationwide implementation of District Builder in or before 2021? Uh, yes, it will come down to funding. And if anyone has uh, some insight into funding, uh, but we've we figured out what we think it will, uh, we're going to need to do in order to build a, a national scale system that would be more scalable and simpler to set up and use. Uh, uh, and we think it's realistic to do so. Uh, we would like to go beyond just the 50 states and be able to support local. Uh, I'd say a third of the implementations of District Builder were at the local level and I think some of the biggest impacts uh, happened at the local level as well. Is district population the only statistic that's generated on the fly or displayed on the right-hand side of District Builder, or can other metrics be displayed there as well? Uh, no, any metrics can be displayed that are loaded into the system, so you can have uh, uh, any demographic metric that you would want to load. You could have election results, things that are by default calculated on the fly, they're all calculated on the fly, but the things that are displayed by default in the default configuration is population balance, contiguity, and a compactness metric of some kind, and there are several that can be configured. How does District Builder compare to Dave's redistricting app, another publicly available redistricting software that a previous speaker mentioned? What are the advantages and disadvantages of both? Uh, I can't speak to the future plans for Dave's redistricting. Uh, Dave's redistricting was not an open source project, and uh, so that matters to some people and not to others. I think it was um, uh, nicely designed and put together in the sense that a lot of the data you needed for at least state level redistricting work was packaged with the application. And that was a real advantage. Um, I would also say, though, that they made some technical decisions that have uh, Dave did uh, about the way that it was implemented that had made it challenging to uh, get back up and running without rewriting the whole system. They used a, a, a Microsoft a technology called Silverlight uh, that a lot of machines don't support anymore and Microsoft no longer supports. So the whole user interface would be challenging to even run today. Nonetheless, it was a real uh, contribution to the community, and I know a, lot of, a number of people either used it individually or there were states that also, um, that also used it. In, in general, I don't know that there will be a single standard for this sort of thing, going back to the original question. Uh, there will be several uh, quite good uh, solutions. Uh, ours is aiming at transparency, public web use, open source, and so on. District Builder's open source repository doesn't appear to be super active. Where should I look to contribute to your open source work? What opportunities are there for suggesting features and or contributing to the code? That's a great question. Uh, all of these are, I uh, like the previous, these are all great questions, but uh, that's a particularly, it's a, it's a painful one, and so I find it a very good one. Uh, yeah, as I said earlier, we, we haven't done much work on this. If you look, if, you, if you've used GitHub before, you, you'll know that when you go into a co source code repository in GitHub, it tells you when the last commit was, and ours says four years ago. <laughs> so um, that's why there's so much technical debt. Uh, we are, uh, we think that we may um, have a couple of smaller funding sources uh, that may be coming along in September, October, and our first task will be to 
pay down some of this technical debt to upgrade uh, PostGIS, to upgrade GeoServer, and a variety of other tools, and that will get things back up and running. Our goal is to get it to the point where we can deploy it uh, at, at lower cost and more simply. At that point, I think it will be easier to contribute to, and I would guesstimate that we'll have made some progress on that um, by the end of the year. Uh, uh, we will probably also have a revised set of issues. There's already a hundred some issues in the, uh, uh, that are past either bug reports or suggestions for features. If people have particular suggestions that are recommend taking a look at that issue list, uh, and if it's not in there, uh, adding your ideas to it. How can a person contribute to funding your efforts? Have you considered crowdfunding? Uh, we have not considered crowdfunding. Uh, there may be things that uh, uh, the, the type of funding we're going to need to pull this off is probably greater than we could raise via crowdfunding, would be my guess. But I think crowdfunding can be particularly uh, effective when there's uh, some clear sense of here's, here's a financial goal for this particular thing that we're going to try to do, and I think it's a, it's a good suggestion. Uh, we there's, there's a lot of different levels of, uh, it's gonna probably cost us somewhere in the range of, of uh, 50 to $75,000 to pull off, uh, to paying down the technical debt and getting it to the point where it's easier to deploy. Uh, beyond that, how much it costs is gonna depend on how far we go on a redesign of the user interface, how far we go in terms of new features that we add. We've got a long uh, backlog of, of uh, feature suggestions as well. If anyone's curious, I wrote a blog about this on the uh, Azavia website uh, a week or so ago, and I um, encourage you to take a look at that. And it, that outlines in greater detail uh, why and what types of steps we're gonna be taking here. Thank you very much. All right, thank you.